All right, hello everybody. Welcome back to the software engineering lecture. Um, so in this installment, we continue to talk about design patterns. And uh, we already had that topic last time. We specifically talked about the creational patterns in the last uh, lecture installments. And now we're going to continue with the structural and behavioral patterns. And apart from the purely software oriented ones, we're also going to have a short look at the user interface patterns. All right, so first of all, let's have a look at the structural patterns. These are um, generally used to either compose or uh, hide, abstract away, modify objects. And for a bit of background reading, here's again a, a nice blog post explaining a bit of the, the uh, fundamentals behind structural patterns, but uh, we'll, we're going to, to cover quite a number of examples now too. Especially we're going to have a look at adapter, facade, and proxy. These kind of belong to one and the same subfamily and are very common ones. And of course, also composite and decorator. These are very common patterns that even in modern uh, operating and uh, in modern programming languages, you will encounter uh, quite often. All right, so first of all, let's uh, have a look at the adapter pattern. This is probably the most straightforward uh, of the of the structural patterns. And uh, the fundamental idea is that you have two different interfaces that still have the same fun uh, fundamental functionality. And uh, the adapter class now simply changes the interface of the old class to conform to the new interface, basically. And a very, uh, very real world example for this is what you can see here. This is uh, basically two different interfaces with the same functionality. They deliver power with a specific uh, frequency and voltage and so on. It's just that the shape of the plugs is different. And so an adapter changes the one interface, which is the, the uh, plug shape of the socket, into a different interface, which is, for example, what your uh, your hairdryer or your charging um, your charging block for, for your smartphone needs. So uh, the, the fundamental functionality of the interface is exactly the same, just the shape is different, so to say. And this is exactly what an adapter class solves, just like the real world adapter here does the same thing for uh, power sockets. Um, so now let's look at an example, how this would actually look like in code. Let's say we have a um, original class with which we call legacy rectangle. And here we have a draw method. And this draw method takes X and Y width and height at pa as parameters. And then uh, here we just print it on the console, but in an actual graphical uh, user interface system, for example, this would then simply draw a rectangle on the screen. Um, and now let's say that uh, the system is being updated and now all the uh, the classes use an interface called shape, not any longer something called rectangle, for example, but now everything is a shape. And this still has a draw method, but now, for example, we don't use uh, X and Y of the center and width and height, but now we have uh, upper left and lower right corner, for example. And so what the adapter does, all the adapter does is that it basically creates an internal representation of the old class. In this, uh, in this example, it's the leg legacy rectangle. Um, this is private, so this is entirely within the uh, the adapter class, uh, and it's created along with the adapter. And then, when this draw method is called, the draw method of the new interface, then the parameters are simply translated in such a way that uh, they will still fit to the old interface. The functionality in the end is still exactly the same. You will have you will uh, have a rectangle drawn on the screen or in this case printed on the console. But uh, so the, the actual outcome doesn't change at all. It's just the way that the, the parameters are, for example, passed to the interface. Here it's uh, in the form of upper left and lower right corner. And in the old interface, it was just uh, one corner and width and height. But the end result will be exactly the same. Just uh, you, so you can basically reuse the old code as is uh, without having to write everything, rewrite everything. You can just wrap the adapter around the old classes. 
There's two other very common patterns that um, are often also more or less used interchangeably with adapter. There's the facade. Facade is basically just a larger type of adapter. This gives you um, a simplified interface for a, for a larger set of objects. So let's say you, have, you need to, to um, instantiate a networking object and a buffer object and uh, maybe a processing object and so on and all of this has to happen in a specific order and the objects have to link uh, with each other and if you have to do this again and again then it makes sense to create a facade object that simply wraps around this sequence of, of uh, object creation and linking and that you can use to, to uh, just basically have a few simplified calls that you can issue to the facade and then that will internally uh, basically trigger trigger all sorts of behavior of the other in internal objects. Um, a special case of the adapter is kind of a proxy, called a proxy a pattern. Um, this means that the interface stays the same, so um, you can actually treat an object without the proxy and an object that's been encapsulated in the proxy, you can treat them exactly the same. Usually they even share a common uh, superclass, for example, so they exactly ha have exactly the same interface. However, the proxy adds additional functionality. So, um, and there's quite a number of, of interesting use cases how you can use such a pro uh, proxy. For example, if you have uh, objects that take a long time to create, for example, because they actually represent a, a big data set that you first have to um, to load into memory and so on, then you could have a proxy object that uh, already allows you to, to interact with the object, but maybe will just uh, queue up the commands. And as long as you are interacting with the proxy object, in the background, the uh, actual data will be loaded into memory. And as soon as that has happened, um, then you can actually uh, interact with the data directly. And before that, the proxy will just um, store your commands, for example. Or you could also have a local representation for uh, remote data. This is kind of similar. So um, you interact with the object as if it was on your local machine, but the proxy actually forwards the uh, the data across the network and uh, delivers back uh, the output from the uh, remote object um, from the point of view of your uh, of your program it doesn't actually make a difference if you're interacting with the local object or with the proxy um, but the proxy of course can then uh, transparently handle all the network connection and so on you could also have uh, a proxy uh, you could use the proxy packet to solve something like access control so um, if the object that you're actually dealing with is kind of sensitive, contains sensitive data, or is maybe uh, connected to some kind of hardware setup that needs to, to also be access controlled, then this could be done through the proxy object. So only if the correct uh, credentials are supplied, then the proxy will allow access. Otherwise, um, and wh when the credentials are correct, then you can again interact with the object just like it, uh, like it was without the proxy. Uh, on the other hand, if the credentials are wrong, then the proxy will block access, of course. And um, last but not least, one very common use case for uh, the proxy pattern, especially in a language such as C++, is to have something like reference counting. In Java, this is already built in. In C++, for example, this is sometimes called a smart pointer. This is a pointer to a object or a memory area that counts along how many times it actually has been uh, has been used or accessed and if that number drops to zero then it will automatically clean up the object this can sometimes be very helpful to to manage your memory better especially once again in a language such as c plus plus which doesn't have a native uh, garbage collector for example and uh, again the the idea behind the proxy pattern here is that you can use the the proxy object exactly in the same way which in which you could use a regular object so uh, the proxy pointer the smart pointer acts 
exactly the same as a regular pointer, but internally it additionally does this uh, this reference counting to make sure that once nobody is using the object anymore, it will be cleaned up. All right, so these were a couple of very straightforward patterns. Adapter, which uh, changes an interface to uh, match a new interface with a similar functionality. Facade, which um, wraps a larger number of objects which are related to each other and need to be connected and uh, so on into a simple yeah, facade. And proxy, which um, provides the same interface as the original object, but with additional functionality. All right. Um, the next uh, structural pattern I'd like to talk about is the composite pattern. This is a very common pattern too. And whenever you want to represent something that's uh, a tree in the in the computer science sense, uh, yeah, a tree structure, then the composite pattern is very helpful. So you can represent something like a, a folder or directory tree on your on your disk. Um, you can represent a user interface which contains nested widgets. You can um, represent something like a scene graph in, in 3D modeling or in a ray tracer, for example. All of these uh, can very easily be modeled using the composite pattern. And the fundamental idea is that I have a, a superclass, which let's just call it component, that also has a function traverse, which allows me to walk through any part of the tree. And derived from that, I have um, one subclass leaf, which is basically a, a final node, which doesn't have any further subnodes. And I have the actual composite uh, class, um, also derived from component, which can contain uh, unspecified number of other components. And these uh, components, which each composite contains, can in turn, of course, be either leaves or other composites. And that already, um, I think, gives you a, a good example of how you can represent any tree-like structure uh, with this pattern. Um, so let's look at a brief example. For example, here, uh, this is now a rep representation of a directory structure on on your disk or uh, on your SSD or whatever. So we start off with the class directory entry. This is uh, the component class in the previous slide. Here we have a traverse method, which isn't implemented yet, and just a name. Then for the file, which is kind of the leaf in the tree, uh, which can't have any further uh, subnodes. Uh, this also, of course, extends the, the superclass. We assi can assign a name, and when we call this traverse method, then we just print out the name of the uh, file. And the really important uh, aspect of the pattern is now in this directory class, which is corresponding to the composite from the from the pattern on the previous slide. Again, of course, we extend the uh, directory entry class. Um, we have the ability to add a name, of course. And now we have also have the ability to add additional leaves or uh, additional directories. So any other object from this hierarchy can also be added and will be stored in this uh, in this array list. And the uh, most important aspect is actually here in the traverse method. When I call this method, then I will now, first of all, again, print out the name of the current object. And then I will walk through the list of all the sub entries and also call traverse on them. And that alone is enough to already um, create a functionality that will walk through the entire tree and for every node and leaf in the tree will uh, print out its name and the names of its, um, of its sub elements. So this is a very powerful pattern. This uh, it ha actually has a very simple structure as you, uh, as you saw in the previous slide. All right, so much for the composite pattern. Now let's look into a kind of similar pattern, which is decorator. Um, the fundamental idea behind decorator is that I can add specific types of functionality on the fly and can also stack these types of functionality. A very 
A nice example for this is the stream interface of Java. So I can, uh, for example, start out with a file stream and then I can wrap that in a, or decorate that with this ASCII 7, uh, seven bit formatting uh, decorator. And then I can wrap another decorator gzip around that, which compresses the data and so on. Um, the interface will always stay the same. So all of these are stream objects and uh, the, the actual methods I can call on the object will uh, always remain the same. Um, but the internal functionality will change with every additional decorator I'm adding on top. The structure of the decorator pattern is actually quite similar to composite. The main difference is actually, if you look into the class diagram on the next slide, this is a slide, um, the topmost part is actually very similar to, uh, to the composite pattern with the one difference that the decorator object, which is kind of corresponding to the composite object in the previous pattern, this only has one reference to, uh, to the a superclass, not a list of references. And from this decorator class, I can now derive various other decorators. And um, from my, my basic functionality is now here in what corresponds to the leaf class in the composite example previously. Um, so let's just have a look at how this example would work like in practice. So if we have this representation of various types of coffee, then I can, of course, first create this basic coffee, which is the, the base uh, stream, and then add a decorator, which uh, uh, creates, which adds milk, basically. And when I then call the list of ingredients for this object, then I'm just getting coffee with milk. And later on, I can now actually add additional decorators to that existing object. So I can add two extra espressos, for example, two additional decorators to that object. When I print out the list of ingredients now, I will get the additional information appended uh, to, the, to the previous object. So this is the, the fundamental idea behind the decorator pattern that I can add functionality on the fly and still use the object that uh, results in the same way uh, as I could have the, the original object.